Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, praise team, for leading us. And hey, thank you, church, for filling up the front of the church with a lot of food. I mean, this is this is just really, really amazing. I think that I have to probably echo what Larry said. I was not expecting it to be this full, especially just in the first service. I thought maybe in the second service we'd start spilling over. And so uh, you guys have done an incredible job just being gracious and generous and faithful to the Lord uh, in your giving. So thank you for doing that. And I know that um, it'll be a blessing to many people and allow them to be able to meet some of those needs that they struggle meeting uh, each and every week. You know, as I was getting ready um, for coming over this morning, I, I grabbed my, my Bible and I always, you know, I usually I tuck notes or things that I'm given into uh, my Bible. Like, for example, here's the lights left on note from what, like two months ago, you know, or something like that. It gets stuck in there and then I forget about it. Uh, but I found this in that, my Bible this morning. Uh, it was a, it's a picture that one of our younger church members uh, drew and brought to me after the second service, usually is whenever she's in here. And um, you know, I, I don't have time to describe all that is on this picture, but it really truly is incredible. And um, the reason I bring this up is, you know, if your kids are drawing in the church pew or writing things in the church pew, this is incredible. This is training them to take notes because a lot of times they'll come up to me and they'll have something. They drew something that I preached on. There's one young lady, she loves to draw me behind the pulpit. She gets my hair right every time. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know what uh, Pac-Man had to do with what I was preaching that day. Uh, but if, you have, if you've got kids that draw pictures or take notes, I'd love to see it. I'd love to keep these things and um, hold on to them. Who knows? They might get stuck in my Bible. Or, or get posted on Facebook or something. Well, today we are continuing our journey through Galatians. We're in week two, and uh, week two of this particular series called Setting the Stage. And so these first four weeks are trying to set the stage for where we are in Galatians, what is the purpose of Galatians, and, and uh, all those kind of details to set us up for moving forward through this incredible letter that we have here in the New Testament. And so last week, we wrapped our minds around the backstory, understanding the, the purpose and the people who are involved in this situation. And today, we're moving on to the motivation, okay, the reason for the writing of this letter. And in this case, it's a major conflict. And when I say the conflict is major, I mean it is very major. It is essential. It is central and fundamental to who we are as Christians and what we believe. Uh, last week, remember I told you that Paul usually follows a certain pattern whenever he writes a letter. A typical first century letter would include in it a section of thanksgiving. Uh, it would be about the fourth part of the introductory to the letter, thanksgiving. What, why is he thankful for this group of people? If you look in the letter to the Corinthians or the Ephesians or Philippians, he explains to them why he's grateful for them and how he thanks God for them. Well, not so in this letter to the Galatians. He jumps straight from the blessing, you know, uh, blessing them in the name of God the Father and all that kind of stuff. He jumps straight from the blessing to the what in the world are you thinking kind of statement. Uh, he goes right to the heart of the matter. He skips the thanksgiving and gets right to it. So it shows his pure frustration and shows that as he's writing this letter, it tells the Galatian church, hey, you better be ready. You better put the gloves on because we are about to throw down in this letter, okay? And so we're going to get into this section where he begins uh, questioning their, uh, their thoughts and questioning what is going on there in the church. So if you have your Bibles, open to Galatians chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 6. Paul writes, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want you to distort the gospel of Christ. But if, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. For am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I try, trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that life-giving, life-saving, eternal life-providing truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you came to earth, lived a perfect and sinless life, that you died on the cross as a substitution for our sins, and that by placing our faith, our complete dependence and trust upon you and the work that you have done, we can receive eternal life. Thank you, Jesus for what you have done for us on the cross and through the power of your resurrection to win victory over death and give us eternal life. We give you praise for that this morning. And Lord, may we as a church hear what Paul is saying today and make sure that we maintain a pure gospel, the pure truth of what Jesus has done for us and how we can find eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for this good word today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as we continue thinking about storytelling, any good you know, novel or uh, story requires a conflict, right? That's what keeps us engaged in the story. It's that sense of mystery, that sense of adventure, of discovery, of trying to figure out where the, uh, the thread of the story is going, and we hope that we have a conclusion at the end. Right? Most good stories have a conclusion at the end where, you know, everything kind of wraps back up. You know, the, the average sitcom or, or, or drama, you know, for a long time, they would wrap it up every 30 minutes. It made you think that any conflict could be resolved in 30 minutes minus commercials, right? And so, um, you know, nowadays you, they leave you with more cliffhangers. You know, they'll, they'll set up a, the sequel, you know, episode 35 because they're going to leave you hanging off the cliff and, and want, wanting you to come back for the next uh, the next installment of the movie or the show. But a good novel involves conflict. But you know, one thing that, that uh, we are obsessed with is that idea of figuring out the solution, figuring out the mystery. That's why true crime podcasts and, and TV shows and, and movies and all those kinds of things have become so popular in our culture. Used to, it was just Dateline and 2020, right? And nowadays, it's every, you know, you can find podcasts, TV shows, movies, Netflix series, everything that has a true crime because we think that we can figure it out, right? All along the way, it keeps you engaged because you're trying to figure it out. And then at the last episode, you're like, whoa, I finally understand. Well, one place we don't want to see conflict is in the church. Am I right? One place we don't want to see conflict is in the church, especially around theological issues. There's always going to be disagreements or different viewpoints on something about, you know, within the church or the way that we're doing a ministry or a, a plan that we're doing as a church. But what we don't want to see are people arguing over those key doctrines of the faith. And that's really what we see here that Paul is having to address in Galatians. A disagreement, a distortion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let's look at it and ask, ask the question, what is the conflict? Okay, that first question, if you're taking notes, what is the conflict? We see it in verses 6 and 7, where Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel. Now he, says very he says very clearly, there's not another gospel. So not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so what we see here back there in Galatians is that people inside and outside the Galatians churches were distorting the true gospel of salvation. Okay, that is the conflict. That's what Paul is writing about. That people inside and outside, and we'll look at who those people are later in the, the series. People inside and outside the church there in Galatia were distorting the true gospel of salvation. And Paul is shocked by this. In fact, the word amazed in the Greek is the word thalmazo, which is most commonly used in the New Testament to describe people's reactions to the miracles of Jesus. And so you think about whenever you're witnessing a miracle of Jesus, he just fed, you know, 5,000 people or he just healed somebody or he just raised up a man who was dead and called Lazarus out of the grave. I mean, all these kinds of things. And it says that people would be amazed at these miracles. I mean, you think about your concept, your uh, understanding of those situations if you were there. It's like us saying, my mind was blown. I was shocked out of my mind. I could not believe it whenever I saw it or whenever I heard it. That's what Paul is saying here. Guys, my mind is blown that you would walk away from the true gospel of Christ. I cannot comprehend. I cannot conceive why you would walk away from the gospel of Jesus, from the true, pure gospel. And he says that they're, look, look, look what he says they're turning away from. He says that you are turning away from God, from Jesus. You are turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ. 
Listen, guys, we have to understand. We're going to look at some distortions of the gospel in a moment. If we turn to these false gospels, it's not just turning away from, to a different view of God. It's not just turning away to a different view of the gospel. What it truly is, is it's turning away from God. It's turning away from Jesus to something that is completely foreign, that is completely different, that has a completely different end focus. You know, whenever they teach people to use a compass, you know, it's very important. I don't know how to use a compass, okay? I have one, and I like to look at it, and I turn it, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and it always points north, and I don't know how to use it, though. If you stuck me in the woods and said, find your way home, uh, I would just, you know, not. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it, okay? I wouldn't make it. But you know, they say that you got you to be accurate on the compass because you could just be one degree off. And that might not really matter much if you're, you know, going, you know, a few hundred yards or something like that, or if you were going a mile. But hey, if you're going 10 miles and you're a degree off, you're going to be way off by the time. Because really, when it comes down to it, there's only one true des- destination point. And so if you're off just by a degree or two when it comes to God, then you're not going after God anymore. You're going after something completely different. Back in the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon addressed this. He was preaching uh, on this topic. And he said, uh, back there in the 1800s, he said, we, not, we have not only another gospel, but we have 50 other gospels now preached. And what Spurgeon said during that time is definitely true today. Spurgeon was addressing what came to be known as the downgrade controversy, which was a tendency in Baptist churches in England to walk away from uh, true Orthodox Christianity to true biblical Christianity and liberalize their theology on four key issues. The denial of the infallibility of Scripture, the denial of the necessity and substitutionary nature of Christ's atonement, the denial of the existence and eternality of hell, and the affirmation of universalism. In other words, a new gospel, a different gospel, a distorted gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can see many of these similar issues in our churches in America today. And nowadays, the Baptist churches in England have, by and large, gone very liberal. And um, even when we, Melody and I were over there in England uh, back in October, talk, speaking with a Baptist pastor, he said, we are facing what the Methodist church is facing um, in America, is that we are deciding, we as a group of Baptist churches, are we going to uh, affirm uh, different gender ideologies and sexual ideologies? And it's really causing a rift within our churches. And so we see that pattern, that destination that is on the horizon if we too go that same way. So that raises the question, is there a distortion of the gospel, something that we have to concern ourselves right here in 21st century America? Okay, is that something we have to concern ourselves? Is this something that we face? And I would tell you this morning, absolutely. We are in a battle for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in a battle for the, for the perceived integrity of God's word. Now, listen to what I'm saying. We're not fighting for the integrity of God's word. God's word stands on its own. It's its own entity. It's its own power. It doesn't need us to validate it and make it true. It is true. It's the word of God. But what we are vying for, what we are fighting for is the perceived integrity of the word of God. To, for people to understand that it is true, that it is warranted, that it is uh, applicable, that it is authoritative, and that it is infallible. And so we need to understand that that is the battle that we are facing. And that's not a battle that we're fighting out in the public square. Listen, that's not the battlefront. Defending the validity of the word of God, defending the gospel in the public square, yes, that's important. But listen, those are fringe battles. Those are skirmishes out on a different battlefront. The true battlefront for the integrity, for the acceptability, for the uh, validity, for the authority of the word of God and the true gospel of Jesus Christ happens inside the churches. It happens inside the churches. Because whenever churches walk away, from the scripture, when churches walk away from basing what they do on the word of God, when churches walk away from the true uh, purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the culture says, well, if they're going to walk away from it, then I'm going to walk away from it too. If they don't think it's that important, then why should we? And so the true battle happens here in the church. 
Paul wrote in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, he says, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. And then he repeats himself. Anytime that scripture repeats itself, that's its way of highlighting, of bolding it, of putting italicized in it, putting underlines. That's how they would make something extra important. And so he repeats himself immediately. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, a curse be on him. This is how important Paul believed that it was that the church maintained the purity of the gospel. And so we have to have that same effect. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to go into some other churches and say, a curse be on you. That probably wouldn't come across really well, right? Uh, but uh, we, we can have some different approaches, right? But that word Paul uses, that, that word curse, is the Greek word anathema. Some of you may have heard that word before. It's where we get our word in English, anathema. All right? Okay, there's no translation. It's just a transliteration, okay? You thought, I, you, you were like, wait, that was, that was brilliant and I missed it. No, you didn't. It was not, okay? But what that word literally means um, is a person or thing accursed or consigned to damnation. Okay, a person or thing accursed or consigned to damnation. It's that Greek word that is associated with the Hebrew word haram in the Old Testament, which described the condition of the nations who were in opposition to God. So during the time of the Exodus and whenever the children of Israel were going into the promised land and God said, I will utterly destroy everybody before you. That's the word that is in play here. That's the strength of the word that Paul uses. That's how he feels about anybody, any group, any situation that would distort the true gospel of Jesus. And so a false gospel, what we can say that, that Paul is saying, a false gospel is by definition a damning situation. And I want you to know, I, I, I thought about this word for a while, and I thought, should I use this word? I want you to understand the strength of what Paul is saying here. And this is a, a proper use of the word, not a cuss word. It's its original intention. Consider synonyms from Webster's The Thoris that I could have used. Calamitous, cataclysmic, catastrophic, disastrous, fatal, ruinous. Those are the kinds of words. Those are the situation. This is the condition of a church or a situation where, uh, where a church walks away from the true gospel. This is what's going to happen to our churches if we do not continue to fight for the truth and the validity of God's word and base our lives on that true gospel of Jesus. It is truly a cataclysmic situation, a damning situation. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we do about this, okay? How do, we, how do we even recognize that this has happened? In other words, how do we spot a false gospel? How do we spot something that isn't true, something that isn't that true gospel of Jesus Christ? How do we spot something like that? Well, I want to just say it this way. Any gospel, any proposed or apparent gospel that takes the focus off the work of Christ is focused in the wrong place, Okay, any gospel whose primary focus is not purely the work of Christ in your life is a distorted, false gospel that is focused in the wrong place. What I mean that is that if there's a gospel that's being preached that is selfish, that is self-centered, that is me-oriented, then it is not the true gospel. Paul wrote about how the gospel had to have its integrity. And he talked about how he received his gospel. Okay, this is, we'll talk more about this next week whenever we look again at the Apostle Paul. But he says in verses 10 through 12, For am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I, trying to, am I striving to please people? Uh, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it. But it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, the only true gospel is the gospel that Jesus gave us. The only true gospel is the gospel that Jesus performed for us whenever he came here and lived his perfect life, whenever he went to the cross and died on that cross on our behalf so that our sins could be forgiven. Even though he was innocent, he took on our guilt so that by in, even under our guilt, we could take on his innocence. And because of that death, he forgives our sins. And then because of his resurrection, he gives us hope for eternal life, for victory over death, spiritual death, eternal death that all of us would face because of our sin condition. 
And if we put our faith in him, then we can receive that salvation. The false gospel always puts the focus on you and what you should become, what you should do, rather than on the Jesus and what he has already done and what he wants to do in you by the power of the Spirit. And keep in mind when we talk about this, we're talking about the, the, the groups that we would consider Christian churches. When we talk about people who are distorting the gospel, who are walking away from the true gospel, and we're going to look at some false gospels here just right up next. Um, we're talking about churches within what we would consider Christian churches. I'm not even including things like uh, Mormonism, which is a completely distorted false gospel, or Jehovah's Witness, which is a distorted false gospel, or any of the other groups that you might fall into that category. I'm talking about actual churches, Christian churches, Christian denominations who are distorting and walking away from the gospel. So let's close this morning. We got five minutes to look at five pervasive false gospels. Okay? Five pervasive false gospels. I shouldn't have written it out that way because I have to say it fast and that's kind of a tongue tire, right? All right, so let's look at false gospel number one. The gospel of Jesus and, okay? And I left it blank, okay? The gospel of Jesus and, and you just fill in the blank after that and. The gospel of Jesus plus anything is a false gospel. You must trust Jesus and do something else too. That is a false gospel. All right, any gospel, any uh, uh, accept, encouragement for you to accept Christ that says, hey, if you want to be saved, you have to trust Jesus and fill in the blank. That is a false gospel. Okay, any gospel that says that you have to uh, trust Jesus and go to a certain type of church or denomination in order to be saved, that is a false gospel. Any gospel that says you have to believe in Jesus and do these other works within the church in order to truly be saved is a false gospel. Any gospel that says you have to believe Jesus and be baptized or your salvation is incomplete is a false gospel. Any gospel that says you have to do G believe in Jesus and do something else is false. Okay, the work of Jesus that he did on the cross is enough. What he did is enough. And trust me, there is nothing that you can do to supplement the work of Jesus. There is nothing that you can do to supplement the work of Jesus. That's like asking a child to supplement the work of a brilliant neurosurgeon. It's just not needed. It's not helpful. It's just a distraction from what is truly taking place. And so uh, Paul writes about this in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He says, you are saved by grace, through, by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's, a, it's God's gift, not from work so that no one could boast. If there is any part of the salvation process that you are told or presented with that includes you doing something to help. It is a false gospel. Another distorted gospel is number two, the gospel of sincerity. The gospel of sincerity says it doesn't really matter what you believe so long as you're sincere in your belief. And listen, this is the cry of our culture, the rallying cry of our culture. Believe what you will, just be sincere. Speak your truth. We are surrounded by a secular culture, and you better believe that even our secular culture has its view of the gospel. The esteemed Bible scholar D.A. Carson kind of catches this when he writes, Secularization refers to the process that squeeze, uh, processes that squeeze religion to the periphery of life. The result is not that we abandon religion or banish the gospel. Rather, religion is marginalized and privatized, and the gospel is rendered unimportant. What he's saying there is that our world will, and our churches are falling into this trap. They make the gospel so much about you and what you want to believe, what you want to hold as true, that they say, hey, listen, as long as you're sincere in what you believe, that is okay. But listen, somebody can be sincere in what they believe, and they can be sincerely wrong. Okay? There are lots of times where my kids come to me and they tell me something that they believe is true and I say, let me tell you, that is most definitely not true. Okay? I don't care how much you believe that candy would be a great dinner tonight, that is sincerely wrong. Right? A Mountain Dew at 9.30 is not going to happen. You're going to bed. Right? And so, sincerity does not make truth. I want you to understand that. Sincerity does not make truth. Belief does not create truth. Faith does not create truth. It is in what you put your faith. Is that true? That's what really matters. 
I, can, I saw a picture this week, and it was like a, because uh, somebody asked this question, and it was like a, a, a picture of a canyon, you know, like the Grand Canyon or something. And they said, well, you know, somebody was saying, does it really matter what you believe uh, as long as you're sincere? And somebody said, well, if you believe there was a bridge across this canyon and you stepped out on it, would your sincerity do you any good? Absolutely not, right? Listen, you have to believe in what is true in order for it to be valid. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, if it doesn't matter what you believe so long as you're sincere, then the cross was the most cruel act of God that he could ever perform. Because Jesus' death on the cross would have been unnecessary. His suffering would have been unnecessary. It would have been pointless. But he went there because he believed and he knew it was true that what uh, he had to do had to be done because he is the only way to the Father. And the third false gospel we see this morning is the gospel of self-help. The gospel of self-help says you are saved by Jesus so that you have the ability to become the best you. You have the ability to become the best you. We live in a world that loves the idea of self-help. How many do-it-yourself TV shows are there? We have entire TV channels devoted to do-it-yourself. You can build your own house. You can fix your own car. You can do all these kinds of things. And listen, there are some of you out there that can do those things. You're great DIYers. There are some of you out there, I'm not walking into a house that you built. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to do it. All right? I'm not going to drive across country in the car that you fixed up. And trust me, you don't want to drive across the country in the car I fixed up either. We live in a world of DIY. There are over 70,000 self-help books on Amazon right now. So whatever you're dealing with, there's probably a thousand books to help you get through it, right? But God is not concerned with you discovering who you can be the best, with you creating your best self, with you bringing out the best in you. Listen to what God is concerned with in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says, We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. Okay, listen to that. We are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. Hey, listen. You do what you want to do, but if I have the choice of being discovering my best self or being transformed into the glorious image of God, I'm going to choose that one. I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose that one. I would much rather turn out looking like Jesus than turning out looking like the best that Dustin can be, all right? This is not, you know, be all you can be in the army. This is not that, right? This is trying to become the best person that God has designed and created you be through the power of the Holy Spirit and into the image of Christ. That's who we need to be. The fourth false gospel is the gospel of prosperity, Jesus will take away all your struggles if you just have enough faith. Listen, the prosperity gospel is wreaking havoc on the lives of faithful people in this nation and around the world. The prosperity gospel is running rampant because it feeds our selfishness and it disguises itself as genuine faith. Ray Ortland Jr. said, First, the prosperity gospel is found nowhere in the Bible. The prosperity gospel is cold-hearted materialism in religious disguise. Any gospel that says you are saved by grace so that you can have your debts paid, so that you can have health for the rest of your life, so that you can have a life of comfort, so that you can have a fat bank account, any gospel that says that is the end goal is a false, distorted gospel. Jesus promised us we would have struggles. It was a guarantee. The Bible speaks often about the opposite of financial prosperity for those who follow Jesus. Let's consider 2 Timothy 3, 11 through 12. Paul writes, "What what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That doesn't sound like prosperity in the earthly sense. But there is a guarantee of prosperity in the eternal sense. Because those who trust in the Lord will eventually enter into eternal life in his presence. The last gospel that I want to look at this morning, the last false gospel, is the gospel of the status quo. And the gospel of the status quo says salvation gives eternal life, but doesn't require you to give up your life of sin. And listen, believe it or not, this is a growing movement in the Christian church. 
that you can believe in Jesus by faith and continue living whatever sinfulness that you are engaged in. If you're an alcoholic, then just keep on being an alcoholic because your eternal life is secure. It doesn't matter what you do in this life. If you're living a non-biblical lifestyle, it's okay because eventually you'll go to heaven and you'll be you know, purified when you get there. Listen, the scripture is absolutely, completely opposed to that mindset. Let me read you a few verses. Romans 2, 4 says, Do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, to turning away from your sin? 2 Corinthians 7, 10, For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. How do we do that? Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Listen, the scripture continuously reminds us that salvation in Jesus Christ means returning from our sin and turning to something better. And so we need to understand that anything that says you can just keep on living that life of sin and you're just okay is a false gospel. The gospel transforms our life and makes us new. And we invite our praise team to come up and lead us in our invitation time. You know, in answer to all of these things, I want to make sure that I share with you the true gospel this morning. And I've already mentioned it once, but I want to say it again. The true gospel is this. Jesus gave his life in your place so that the guilt of your sin, because all of us are guilty of sin, so that the guilt of your sin could be forgiven and you could receive eternal life, which entails the Holy Spirit transforming your life here and preparing you for eternal life with God. And the way that you receive that eternal life is by placing the complete responsibility, completely, complete control of your life in the hands of Jesus and trusting him by faith. You put your life in his hands and you let go and you let him get in the driver's seat. That is the gospel. Putting full trust in Jesus Christ for you, eternal salvation. And when you do that, the spirit comes into your life and guides you and, and supports you and encourages you and directs you in this life now and prepares you for the life to come. And if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if maybe you've been following one of these distorted gospels, I would encourage you this morning to give up on anything that is focused on what you can do for Jesus or focused on the selfishness that draws out what Jesus can do for us. But just truly say, listen, Jesus did that for me. I want to put my life fully in his hands. And wherever he takes me, that's where I'm going to go. Wherever he directs, that's what I'm going to go. Whatever he wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to trust his will for my life. If you want to respond and give your life to Jesus, I'll be standing in the back, and I'd love to talk with you about that. For those of us who are Christians, we need to commit ourselves to maintaining the purity and authenticity of the true gospel of Jesus. I'm proud that we have a church that is that way. We have to maintain that as a church, but we also have to be a beacon for that among our fellow brothers and sisters in other churches and churches around our world. We have to fight for the integrity of the gospel.